this house and to worship Him. You may be seated. Jesus said, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness will be satisfied. Um, this church is hungry. Y'all are hungry here. And um, God's promise to us is that God is going to, you're going to be satisfied. God, God's going to give you the desires of your heart. You're going to be, be satisfied. And uh, it's just such a privilege to come and to speak here um, today. I, I, I get excited when I come. Um, there's just so much fire. I see a lot of new faces here this morning. And, um, and it's just so exciting to be here. My wife. Uh, Lori is homesick for right now, and just to tell she wants to tell you she loves y'all and she hated to miss. And um, I felt lonely pulling up here without her. It's unusual for me to do anything like this without her being right with me. And as I was pulling, usually when we travel like that, we're kind of, you know, cutting up a little bit and just talking about how fun it is to come do this kind of stuff and preach and all. And when I was making the service road thing up, you know, usually I might have turned and said something as we got close and I looked and she wasn't sitting there. I'm like, I didn't like that. <laughs> so, but anyway, but praise God. She never gets sick. I was sick last week and then she, she wasn't feeling good last night. And, um, but, but, but again, it's just such a privilege to be here. And, uh, I, I was telling some of the guys earlier, um, when I'm with Pastor Carl, he's always so excited about this church, um, about this, about y'all, the people here. He loves uh, Joseph and, and Lester and the guys he meets with. I mean, when I talk, when I get with Pastor Carl, I forget the man's age. I mean, he has so much passion. He has so much fire. And um, for those of y'all who've never heard me say this, I mean, y'all y'all are so privileged to be a part of Pastor Carl's life. I mean, I, I tell God I'm thankful all the time that our paths crossed and I got to meet that man and just, just to be around him. And just his ministry is just such a joy. So... But for those of y'all who don't know me, I've seen some new faces. Um, my wife and I pastor the World Prayer Tabernacle uh, Campus in Covington. And if you haven't already figured it out, I'm not from Covington, I'm from Chalmette. <laughs> so, and, but I'm not ashamed of that. I'm not ashamed of Chalmette. And I'm not ashamed of the way I talk. So if you all into like the way things sound and sit in structure and all that kind of stuff, then you're looking at the wrong person. But, but it's exciting. And it's, it's just such a privilege, you know, to share and... Um, and Pastor Vic just shared about, you know, God has given all of us the ministry of reconciliation. And uh, I recently did a, um, a series at our church called Rising to the Call. And, um, you know, so many times, especially when you get in, in, you're in church and you're surrounded by Christians all the time, you, you kind of begin to think, the devil gets us to think that the only people that God has really called are ministers. You know, whether it's missionaries or pastors or, or whatever, and, and, and God does call those people, but, it, but what ends up happening is everybody else feels like, well, what do I do? Well, you're just as important as the, men, as the missionary or the pastor or anybody else that is called. And one of the things I said in the series is that, you know, God doesn't call us to something. He calls us to someone. Amen. And every one of us is called to Jesus Christ. That, that's your first calling. Yeah. So we all, you know, we all meet that criteria as... Christ is our calling, so, and, um, but it, praise God for people who are willing to sacrifice, to, to say no, like you said, and to say yes to the things of God, to give up things and to go travel other places in the world, to give up all of the amenities and the things that we enjoy here in the United States. I'm thankful for that, but you're called in Mattery, in Kenner, wherever God has placed you, whatever secular job you're at, that is your calling. That's where God's placed you, so. So praise God. Um, let me just start off um, this morning just asking this question. And some of you have probably either said this question or you've heard someone else say it. But why do bad things happen to good people? Yeah. Have you, you, you've either said that or you've heard somebody else say that. And that, that's something I've, hear, I've heard a lot. But I've never really heard anyone say, why do bad things happen to bad people? Or, why do good things happen to good people? Or, why do good things happen to bad people? Because all of those are true. But we only, we, the, the thing that we focus on is, why do, why do bad things happen to good people? So, the next question is, well, who is good? The Bible says, there's no one good. There's none righteous, no, not one. So, when we say, why do, why do bad things happen to good people? What what good people are you talking about? <laughs> God, God makes it very clear. There's none of us. There's none of us that that is good. So, so really, who was the judge of who was good and who was bad, and who are we to question why things happen? You know, who am I to sit back and judge? Well, that's a good person, and a bad thing happened, and that's a bad 
person and a bad thing happened and, and I'm sitting there trying to like be God and say, well, I, you know, I get this, but I don't get that. Who, who, who are we really to judge those things? Uh, Solomon wrote in the book of Ecclesiastes, there's a time for everything. There's a time to be born and a time to die. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to weep and a time to laugh. And then in verse 14 in chapter 3, he says, I know that everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to it, nothing, nothing taken from it. God does it so that people will fear Him. So the common denominator in every event that occurs is this, it's God. In other words, no matter what it is that's happening in our lives, whether we consider it a good thing or a bad thing, the thing that you and I need to see is God. So it's really not bad things happening to good people, it's God in complete control of everything that takes place. That's what, that's what we have to understand. So, so really the question you and I need to ask when confronting bad things or things that we are confronted with or face in, in our lives is who will you praise? The God who gives or the God who takes away? So that's the title of our message this morning is who will you praise? And um, you see, you and I as Christians, and this is really important, especially for younger Christians in here this morning, for us to really grasp the principle and the concept of God's sovereignty. That, that is so crucial for us to get that, you know, regardless of how long we've been saved, but especially as a, as a new Christian or as a new believer, to understand what, what sovereignty is or what God's sovereignty really means. So the first thing we have to understand when we look at God's sovereignty is God is sovereign. And, and that means that He is preeminent in power and authority. God, God is, is in complete control of everything, of every event that, that happens on the planet, God, God is in control. The next thing is that we need to understand is God is all-powerful. In Psalm 147 it says, Great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding has no limit. Then we need to understand that He is outside of time. In Psalm, in Psalm 90 it says, Before the mountains were born, or before you had given birth to the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are the eternal God. And then we need to understand that he is responsible for the creation of everything. The Bible says in Genesis, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So God, God created everything. So, but when we look at God's sovereignty, what we, what we need to understand is that God's sovereignty does not remove man's free will. That, that, that's very important for us to understand. That's when we kind of get sidetracked about the good things and the bad things kind of thing because we have to inject the, the fact that God has given us God has given us a free will. So um, God has the power and this is a definition I came across when I was studying for this for sovereignty. God has the power and knowledge to prevent anything He chooses to prevent. So anything that does happen must at the very least, be allowed by God. In other words, that, that, that I thought was an appropriate definition of, of sovereignty. And I, again, this is very important because there's going to be things that, that are going to take place either in your life or my life or things that are going to happen around the world and you're going to look at that and you're going to say, I don't like that or I don't understand that or that doesn't really make sense. And you're going to begin to question, is God, is He still in control? Yes, He is. That's what God's sovereignty is all about. So there's an illustration that's kind of, uh, you know, trivial, but it, it kind of, uh, I think, illustrates the, the, the sovereignty understanding that I came across. If, if I had a bowl right here, and there was, I just placed one ant in that bowl, and I was holding the bowl, and the ant was crawling around in the bowl, there would be no doubt that I was sovereign over that ant. Would you agree with that? That, in other words, the, the ant, he, he would try to crawl out the bowl, and, and if I wanted to, I would let him crawl out the bowl. But if I didn't want to, I'd stop him from going in there. I, I could pick him up, throw him on the ground, and I could step on him. So, so that, I, I'm, I have sovereignty. That, that's God. Just because something happens in your life or in the world that we necessarily don't like or we don't agree with, doesn't mean that God is not sovereign in other words, he, 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 is, he is allowing those things to take place. Very important for us to understand that. So what, what it is that I believe God wants us to do as believers, as Christians and everything, is to trust His sovereign control. 
That was at the end of the day that God wants us to trust, to trust Him. So God is going to, and, and I've seen Him do, it, do this in my life, and, and, and you're going to experience that in your life, that God is going to remove anything in your life that interferes with your trust in Him. Because if there's something that, that's in your life that it looks like you're, like you're looking to trust that more than you're looking to trust the Lord, then, then God, He may remove that, or he, He's going to do something to try to get you to understand that the only thing and the only person you need to trust is Him. Right. Period. Yeah. And that's hard for us to grasp a lot of times in the United States because we have so much. And I believe sometimes that prevents us from trusting God because I have all these other things that I have, right? That these other places you have mentioned, they don't have anything like that. And I know I've heard the testimonies, I've heard the stories, they're, they're open to the gospel. I, I, um, I started with the Gideons, the Gideon International. Those are the guys that give away those, uh, those little testaments. They, they give Bibles out all over the world. Well, when, when we give, when they, we used to do distributions here in the United States, some of the kids at schools or places would go, they, wouldn't, they didn't want the Bibles. But when you go to other places in the world, they said they're lining up. They're just, it's like, you, it's like you're throwing out gold bars to them. Yeah. Because they, they, they appreciate that so much because they, they don't have a Bible. They don't have ten Bibles like you and I have um, at home. So they, they, they appreciate that. So, um, but I believe the story in the Bible that, that best, and there's a lot of stories you could probably go to, to, um, to talk about God's sovereignty. But I believe the one that best <laughs> illustrates the sovereignty of the Lord is the story of Job. And, um, and most of y'all in here are probably familiar with, with the story of Job. If you read, if you read in the beginning there, the, the, the story begins to, to, to talk about a man that, that basically in his day and time, he was like Bill Gates. He, 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 like, he had everything. He, he had wealth. Um, he, he, had, he had land. He had prosperity. He had a beautiful family. And the Bible also says that Job was upright. He, he, he was upright and God-fearing. That, that, that was, that was the, uh, the introduction that the story gives, gives to Job. But, but what is the one thing, when we think of Job's story, what is the one thing we always associate the, the story of Job with? What? Suffering. Right? That, that's the first thing. And that, that is, that's a huge component of Job's story, but that's not... That's not why Job's story was written. At least in my estimation, that's not why it was written. And I think we're going to, hopefully we're going to see that, that here this morning. But, but I believe that his story reveals to us the secret to the relationship that God desires for every one of us. And, um, and it's just amazing, the, the, the story. And I love the story of Job. So I'm not going to read the whole thing. It's too much to read. But we're going to look at a portion of, um, uh, of the story in, jo in uh, Job chapter 1. In verses 6 to 12, it says, One day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. The Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? <coughs> Satan answered the Lord from roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There was no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Does Job fear God for nothing? Satan replied. Have you, have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You have blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the, throughout the land. But now stretch out your hand and strike everything he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, Very well then, everything he has is in your power, but on the man himself do not lay a finger. Then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Then we're going to skip down to verse 20. At this, Job got up and tore his robe and shaved his head. Then he fell to the ground and worshipped and said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. And all this Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. See, God... God in this in this story, God was testing was testing Job, and I believe the response that that Job that Job gave to this test, and Job Job passed the test with flying colors. If, like if if he, if he was going to get a grade, he he'd have got an A plus. He'd have been like a like like a, he got a doctorate in this. He he did it, but I believe the the response that Job gave that this story was written for us to to learn from and to glean from the way we respond. So. 
as believers, and if and, and I remember when I was a young Christian and people would come up and they begin to start testifying about um, different trials they would go through and you know whether it was cancer or an untimely death or all these different things and you know as a young Christian that none of that stuff happened to me yet and I'm thinking you know let's uh, you know I'm a, I can't ever imagine those things happening to me right they they do the, the, the trials are going to come the, the the Bible says James says that that um that they consider it joy when you face trials of, of, of various kinds not not if you face trials when you face trials. He said, he said, consider it joy because he said the testing of your faith, of your faith yes. produces perseverance. Yes. You know, so so that that's what it is. So we're gonna but in, in the Job story here, I believe that there's there is three questions um, that his story answers that I believe we too need to answer. So the first one is in verse nine. It says, Does Job fear God for nothing? Satan replied. So the first question you need to answer is this. Do you trust God or man? See, what I've always been intrigued and fascinated by that by that question that that Satan asked, and it's just, it's a remarkable question. In other words, God God uh, allowed Satan to come before him and said, "This is my servant Job," and he, he he gave access to Job, and 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 Job knew all the wonderful things that God had did for him, that that he had been blessed, that everything he touched had been blessed, and Satan Satan asked Job. Does God does Job fear God for nothing? What 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 Satan was saying was this: You've placed you you've given Job so much so much so many blessings, so much favor around his life. The only reason why Job shows any allegiance to you is because all all the wonderful things you've done for him. But Satan told the Lord, take all the things out of his life, and then surely he will curse you to your face. Does Job serve God for nothing? That's a question I believe you and I need to ask ourselves as Christians. Do I serve God for nothing? In other words, do you serve God just because He's the Lord, or do you serve serve the Lord because of the things you have, or the things He's given you, or your possessions, or do or do you serve God? Do you serve God, or do you fear God for nothing? I have to ask myself that because I don't know. God, God could remove. God could things could happen in my life. Am I just clinging and loving the Lord for who He is? That that's a question I believe every one of us. Need to, need to answer that. Do you serve him for what he's done or for who he is? There's a big difference in that. I, I got to serve the Lord for who he is. Yes, I got to believe that God's going to do great things to me because he will do great things to me. But, but and, and this might sound trivial, but if all God ever does for us is save us, that's enough. Do you realize that's eternal life? That's like, like that, that, that's something you and I did not deserve. The Bible says that our destination was hell. We, that's what, that was our pathway. That's what all of us deserve. Yeah. But by His mercy and by His grace, the Bible says God saved us. Yeah. So we're not, um, you know, God owes us nothing. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't even owe us salvation. But because of His great love, the Bible says He demonstrated His love for us by sending Christ to die for us. So Psalm 23 says, David says, The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Look, look what David said there. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. There's, there's only one thing that, that David mentioned there in that verse. The Lord. The, I have the Lord. There was David recognized if I have the Lord, I lack nothing. That's a place you and I have to come to. And even in our wealth and our prosperity and the things that God blesses us with, you've got to get yourself to a place in your relationship with the Lord that, that, that those things never prevent you from trusting God. They, 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 they can never become a, become a substitute. See, God, God is not enough. He's more than enough. You have, you have to understand that. He, God is more than enough for you. He's all you need. And, and um, I'm just going to read these real quick, but... But um, Jehovah, the, the word Jehovah in the Bible, that's the Hebrew name which, from which we get the name, the name Lord um, in the Bible. So, so Jehovah, you, you probably heard that name before. That's the, that's the Hebrew name in the Old Testament they, they use for the Lord. But there's also um, names that the, that the Lord was given called, called compound names. Names that give a deeper or better description or understanding of who the Lord is. Because one, one word or one name for God is not enough. 
He's like, he's like everything, right? So this is just a few of them, but these are some of the compound names of the Lord. He, he's Jehovah Elohim. He's the Lord, our creator. He's Jehovah Jireh, the Lord, the provider. God's your provider. Your, your employer or the place you work is not your provider. Your 401k is not your provider. Your bank account is not your provider. Jehovah Jireh is your provider. That's what you have to understand, that the Lord is your provider. And then I like this one, he's Jehovah Rapha, the Lord, the healer. Yes. Jesus yes. is the great physician. He'll use doctors and, 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 and nurses and different things, but, but, the, but the Bible says Jesus is your healer. Yes. He's Jehovah Nisi, the Lord, the banner. He's, he's my shield. He's, he, he, he's my defender. He's my, he's my protector. That's who the Lord is. And then he's Jehovah Shalom, the Lord, our peace. What a, what, see, that, that's just a few of them. There's more compound names of the Lord. But, 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 but God, God is everything. And God, see, God, the Bible says God is a jealous God. Why is God a jealous God? Because God, first of all, He is the only God. He is Lord and there is no other. But God does not want you trusting anyone or anything else but Him. Because He, he knows He's the only one that can provide for you. He knows that, you, that He is all we need. So... So God, God, God wants us to trust Him in, 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 in everything that we face. So Psalm 60 says, give, give us aid against the enemy, for human help is worthless. With God we will gain the victory, and He will trample down our enemies. I love that. God, man, man can do a little bit, but man ain't going to do what God can do. <laughs> a man's not going to do for you what God's going to do for you. If you. You can never compare what a man can do to, to what God can do. So we gotta, we got to place our trust in God and not man. So you cannot let the possessions and the things of this life become your trust. You can't do that. I, I'm not saying it's wrong for God to, to bless us. And I, I tell people this in their careers. If you have a job and, and, and you have an a ambition to want to maybe try to get a promotion or, or try to uh, get a different place where you can maybe get a larger salary or, or do this, that's not wrong to do that. I believe God, God desires that, to bless us and to, to add an increase to our life. But you can't ever let those blessings become a substitute for your trust in God. God is your trust. Whether, whether you have everything or you have nothing, God is who I trust. See, and that, that's the place we have to, we have to allow God to, to, to get us to. So you have to ask yourself, has anything in your life become something that you trust more than the Lord? I can't answer that question for you, and you can't answer that for me. But but is, but is there anything in your life that that you that you love so much that that's something that you that has a little bit more, like you, you trust that a little bit more than you trust the Lord? God God doesn't want anything to compete with His trust. Matthew Jesus said in Matthew chapter six, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Yeah. See, I, I can't say that that I love God and I love my possessions, or, or I love God and I love money. It's just what Jesus said. You're either gonna you're gonna love one or hate the other, or you're gonna hate one and love the other. You, you can't say, well, oh no, I, I have it all figured out. I love both. No, you can't love both. I can only love the Lord. God's going to give us his, my heart and my devotion has to be to the Lord. You see, that's your trust. That, 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 that's who we trust in. So Satan asked the Lord, what a question. I, I see, I've said this before to my church and I think I may have said this before to this church. When you read the Bible, this is very important. Pay attention to the details. Or was it, there's a, if a story is given something that kind of stands out, it kind of sticks out, there's a reason why God got there. Satan asked the Lord, does Job fear the Lord for nothing? Do you fear God for nothing? If God removed everything from your life, would you still trust God? Amen. That's, what, that's what we have. That's the place we have to come to. Then the next question we have to answer is this one in verse 12. The Lord said to Satan, very well then, everything he has is in your power. But on the man himself, do not lay a finger. Then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. The next question you have to answer is this. Does anything happen in my life without God's permission? See, this is a, a very difficult question for us to ask, especially when we see all the things that happen around the world. 
the, the, the murders and the, 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 the deaths and the, the suicides and the terrorism and all the, the, the famine and diseases and all these different things. And we have to ask ourselves, are those things really happening with the Lord's permission? Is, is He allowing those things to happen? Well, if the Lord's sovereign, and, and we've, already, we've already determined that, yes, God is sovereign, then yes, those things, God is allowing those things, uh, those things to happen. See, when we read the, the, the story of Job, it's kind of like the, the Lord was pulling the curtain back a little bit and letting us get a peek behind the stage to kind of see what takes place in heaven. And if you notice, Satan had to go to God and get permission. He had to get permission to go, to, to go do the things that he did in Job's life. I believe Satan's got to get permission from the Lord to do anything in our lives. That there's nothing that happens in our lives that God does not first give permission to allow those things to take place. I have to believe that if I believe the Lord is sovereign. See, Satan was not allowed to do anything to Job without first obtaining permission from God. And permission was granted. See, but God, God knew something that Satan didn't know. God knew who, who Job was. And Satan's like, I got this. I know I got this, God. See, I'm going to get you to... I'm going to get you to remove, to let me remove all these wonderful blessings that you've given Job. And I know as soon as you take all the things away from him, he's going to curse you to your face. God said, go ahead and do whatever you want to do to him. But on, his, on the man himself, do not lay a finger. Well, if you read the rest of the story, the, uh, God allowed Satan to also lay his hand on, on Job. And the only thing he didn't do was kill him. He had sores, the Bible says, from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. He said he was taking broken uh, pot, like 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 uh, p pots, breaking breaking them and scratching himself with a broken pot. The, the, the man lost everything, but the Bible says Job did not curse the Lord. Amen. See, Amen. the Lord do something that Satan that Satan didn't know, and Job lost everything. Mm -hmm. You know, none of us can really ever say. Uh, you know, and I guess some people could, but 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 in reality, when we say we suffer or we lose things. Have we, ever, have we ever suffered to the point of Job suffering? He didn't just use, lose his prosperity and his servants and his possessions. He lost his children. All, all of his children, everything was taken, was taken away from him. But God was still sovereign. See, the story of Job is not about his suffering. It's about you and I seeing God for who he is, sovereign in all he does. It's not, it, the focus is not about how much Job suffered and our, our pity party for Job and I feel so sorry for Job and I can't believe it happened to Job. That's not why Job's story was written. Uh, Job's story was written so that you, cannot, you and I would see that no matter what happens in our life, I'm still going to trust God because, God because God is sovereign. See, we, we, we have to understand this, that God is sovereign in all He does. God, God will do with us as He pleases. The Bible says your life is not your own. You are bought with a price. Our, our lives belong to Christ now. They belong to God. So Christians associate uh, God doing good things and Satan doing bad things. And, and I've heard that before. You know, if a good thing happens, that, that's something that God did. And if, it's a, if a bad thing happens, that's something that, that the devil did. But, but sovereignty says that God allows or gives permission for both the good and the bad. See, that's when I've, when I've come to a place as a believer that I've, I've laid it all out before God. I said, God, I'm trusting you now. Like, like I'm, I'm, your, I, my life is in total trust in your hands. The good and the bad. The trials and the, the, the high points and the low points. It, it doesn't matter. God, I'm trusting you. We, we, have, we have to be able to say that. So, um, and everyone wants to ask the question, and um, that only he can answer, you know, why, why do these things happen? Why, why, why do bad things happen? You know, is it, you know we, we ask the question, say, um, was what happened to Job fair? Well, you have to ask the other question, is God fair? So you say, is that right? Is that fair what happened to Job? Well, well is God, is God a, a just and a fair God? Yes, he is. He, he, is, he is a fair God. So some of you might be facing difficulties difficulties today. It might be finances or in your job or maybe strained relationships, maybe a, a, a wayward son or a wayward daughter or a prodigal situation in, in your family and you, you begin to question, you know, has God, has God abandoned me? Has, 
Has God left me? Is, does God still love me? Are, are these things that are happening, is God still with me? I'm here to tell you, yes, He is. Yes. And yes, God still can be trusted. You, you, you can still trust, trust the Lord. Psalm 115 says, Not to us, Lord, not to us, but to your name be the glory, because of your love and faithfulness. Why do the nations say, where is their God? Our God is in heaven, and He does what pleases Him. See, sovereignty for God is trusting God. It's like, God, I'm trusting you. I, see, I've never, had, I've never really had a problem as a believer understanding the sovereignty of God. Because you know why? I'm not God. I get that. I know I'm not God. I know that God created me. And I know that God, God is greater than me. God created me. So therefore, God is in charge. I'm not. So He's sovereign. I, I, I get that. We need to understand that as Christians and as, and, and as believers. It's, it's key to us trusting Him. So as a believer, we can be confident that the Lord we trust gives permission for every event that occurs in your life. You, you, have, to, you have to trust Him. You, it doesn't mean that we, 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 we purposely ask God to do these bad things to, to cause us to want to trust Him. But when, when God allows those things to take place in our life, we have to understand that God is showing us that He wants you to trust Him. Not your circumstance, not your condition, not the things that you have. Then the final question we have to answer is this. At this, Job got up, tore his robe, and shaved his head. Then he fell to the ground and worshipped and said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. In all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. You need to ask yourself, will you praise the God who gives or the God who takes away? See, these, these three verses at the end of, the, uh, at the end of this uh, portion of the passage for Job's story, I believe is the key to, to, the, to the whole reason why Job's story was written. Um, and and, and the, answer, the answer that Job gives and, and the, the way he responded to what God did, did to him I believe teaches us how we need to respond to everything that we face. You have to remember, Job, Job was fearless. The Bible says that Job loved God, that he feared God. And if you read the, the other parts of the story, I didn't read. Job even would, would, would make a sacrifice and pray for his children just in case his children sinned or did something that, he, that his knowledge he was not aware of. He would pray for them just in case to make sure that they were right with God. He feared God. Yet God allowed all of these things to happen in Job's life. So look how Job responded here. Job, Job humbled himself. He didn't, he didn't react. See, he could, he could have been bitter. He could have been angry with God. He said, God, you know, you know I loved you. I, 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 I feared you. I, I, I did all these things for you. And now you've brought all this grief and all this persecution into my life. God, I'm bitter now. But Job wasn't bitter. He remained humble. It, it affected his life as, as it would have any of us. But Job was not... He was not angry. He, he was not angry with the Lord. See, we can't... We, the, the first reaction you and I want to have when we face something is, I want to get angry. I want to ask God, why? Why are you allowing these things to happen? But God might be saying, maybe I'm allowing this so I can show you something else about me that you would have otherwise never seen. You would have never understood me had you not been going through that, that difficult situation. And then Job maintained composure and self-control. He, he, see, Job recognized in, in the depths of his suffering and all the pain that he was experiencing, Job recognized that God was in control. He, he understood that. He, he, didn't, he didn't fly up the handle and, 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 and go crazy. He just, he just maintained his composure. And he understood that, God, you're still in charge. Yeah, this is like the bottom of the bottom of the bottom. But I know that God is still Lord. He understood the sovereignty and the position and the place of God. He said, I came into this world with nothing and I will leave with nothing. See, Job attributed everything in his life to the Lord. Everything that, that he had. And then listen to, 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 to the thing he said here. And I think this is key to this. He said, the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. Now notice what, what, what Job said there. He says, the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. 
And if you read the story, there was a group of uh, Chaldeans and Sabaeans that had came in and had raided part of his thing. He could have said, the Chaldeans and the Sabaeans, the Lord gave it, the, the Chaldeans took away. Or he could have said, the Lord, the Lord gave and Satan took away. But he said, no, the Lord gave and the Lord took away. May the name of the Lord be praised forever. See, that's trusting God's sovereignty. That, that's praising God. Like, whatever your situation is, may the name of the Lord, may the name of the Lord be praised. See, so that's, that's really what we have to, what we have to ask ourselves um, when, when, when we're facing difficult situations. What, who are you going to praise? Are you going to praise the Lord that gives or the Lord that takes away? you got to be willing to say you're going to praise both because it's, it's one and the same. Yeah. He's the same Lord. And you gotta, you got to be able to say, God, I'm going to trust you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to praise you. See, Job understood that his circumstance and condition did not change who God was. Amen. That's key for us to get in our lives. No matter what you are facing in your life right now, it doesn't change who God is. God is still on his throne, the Bible says. God is still seated and positioned, firmly enthroned in heaven, overseeing all that he has created. God is sovereign. Do, do you understand that? that? That's so key for us to get. Because once we've crossed over and we accept the sovereignty of the Lord, then whatever it is that God allows to, for us to face, I'm still going to trust Him. Amen. I'm never going to turn. I'm never, there's no going back. There's no like, well, I can't take it, God. This is too hard. This is too difficult. No, I'm going to trust God. Amen. I'm going to trust. I'm going to trust His sovereignty. So, so you have to be able to say that that, that, that uh, you're going to trust the Lord that gives and the Lord that takes away. Job said, may, the, may, the, may his name be forever praised. May the name of the Lord be forever praised. So why don't you stand to your feet? We'll close here. Remember, we're running a little over, but um, it's not my fault in Jesus' name. <laughs> it's all good, though. It's all good stuff. Yeah, that's right, exactly. God knew that this was going to happen before it happened, right? So praise God. Well, I don't know everybody's heart here, so I, I believe it's always appropriate to give an opportunity for salvation and you come to gather together in God's name. So, so I'm just going to ask everyone maybe just to bob your head and close your eyes just for a moment. And, and, and maybe then the, the, the things that, that Pastor Victor shared or the, the worship that we had earlier, or just the, just the presence of God's Holy Spirit in this place. Uh, maybe you just felt maybe some conviction or you maybe felt the, the, the God moving in your life or just uh, tugging at your heart. A little bit, and you say, you know, you're talking about praising God and loving the Lord through circumstances, and you think, well, you know, I'm facing some things, but I'm, I don't really have a relationship with God where I can really trust Him. Well, God wants to do that for you this morning. So, with nobody looking around, and you say, you know, I want to, I, I want to know the Lord. I want to know Christ. I want to, I want to confess Him as Lord. I want Him to come into my life and just heal me and and, and cleanse me and forgive me. I want to make Him Lord. Will you pray with me today? Will you just encourage me today before I leave? And I would love to do that with you. So if that's you this morning, and you've, you've never just prayed a simple prayer, which is this. Yeah. You just said, Jesus, I need you. Because we all need him. Yeah. And you want me to pray with you this morning. Just slip your hand up for just a second before we leave, and I'll pray with you before we go. Praise God. Praise God. Well, I know it's late, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give an invitation here, and if you have to be excused to go, I, I completely understand that. But I just want to give an invitation to anyone out there this morning that maybe you are facing a situation right now that, that's difficult. That, that maybe, if you be honest with yourself, you maybe question God's sovereignty. You don't understand why this is happening, but you want to still praise Him even through the circumstance. You want to... You wanna, do what you want to answer the way Job said. May the name of the Lord be praised. And you just need me to pray with you today and just encourage you today. Just come up here to the front and I'm going to ask Pastor Joseph and, and, and maybe we'll just lay hands and just pray with you before you go. So anybody here here um, this morning, you just want us to encourage you today. You're going through a difficult situation and you just want to tell God I'm going to praise you through this. Why don't you just come up to the front here for a second.